Happy Friday, everyone. It's take number two. Welcome to being live on Facebook. Hey, I'm in a really good mood today because why? It's because of you. I really appreciate your participation. I love when people give me feedback. I love when they actually challenge me on certain issues. I just love the fact that we're all working together. I don't feel like I'm just talking to a phone all the time, to some little black dot. I can see all of you out there now trying to learn, trying to implement what it is I'm trying to teach. And I really appreciate that. And yesterday I got some pretty good feedback that you seem kind of laughing over because I had a couple of people reach out to me and say, Brian, love the video but dude brother back the bus up so I'm like what do you mean back the bus up they go we love the demonstration that Joshua was doing with his dog but it was a mile away I couldn't see what was happening can you come a little closer and show step by step exactly what was going on and then others wrote in and said hey man I live in a town home when I step outside my door, I'm in the battlefield right then and there. I don't get time to see a dog coming from 50 feet away or 100 yards away. And then someone else wrote in and said, I live in a downtown high rise. I have to go down an elevator anytime for about six to eight times a day. And every time that door opens, I'm wondering what's behind door number two. So I get all of that, and that's why, that's why when we teach this technique to you today, I am going to back up the bus. I'm going to show you exactly how to use the deactivation technique that Joshua was showing yesterday with Vesper. But the reason why we want to do this is that you have really two types of memory. You have explicit over here, explicit, and then we have implicit over here. That's the habit-forming thing. That's that habit. Again, I joke around all the time. They change the rules. On red lights, we now start going. Green lights, we stop. I'm toast because of this right here. I'll never get it done. But when you're first teaching this technique to your dog, it's going to go from explicit memory to eventually implicit, and the same thing goes for you. And when that happens, that's literally a biological reflex. And that's what it needs to be when you pop out of an elevator and doors open and all of a sudden, oh, geez, I got to make my dog sit. Or you're around the corner, oh, I wasn't expecting you. I have to make my dog sit. So I get it. I've actually lived in those type of conditions other than the high rise, never lived in one of those. Never want to. But anyway, so when you guys said back up the bus, that was funny because the very guy you're talking about, Joshua, I'm telling him that all the time. See, when it comes to dog training, he's over here in this land. And I tell him, Joshua, back the bus up, man. You got to teach me like I'm a two-year-old. You got to do step by step. Break it down to a periodic table. Maybe they're over here in explicit land. They haven't gotten here yet. Back it up. So needless to say, you can go ahead and show him, Mackenzie. Yeah, he's got this big old grin on his face right now. Yeah, he's sitting there going, yeah, Brian, see what you're talking about? I see what you're talking about. You just got caught on it, too. So let's just get to... Get busy here and quit our grinning and get down to learning. Okay, the technique I'm going to show you real fast here is, first of all, here's the thought process behind it. Again, trying to stay in tune with nature. Call it what you want to. We just call it escape and avoidance uh, because why? When wolf grabs wolf, the wolf on the bottom, the wolf that's being grabbed, typically wants to escape that situation. And then later, they want to avoid it altogether. So in escape conditioning, a couple things. One... It's really intended pairing. So in other words, if I go up here to my dog red zone right here, and I'm just going to show this real quick, and then I'll back it up and I'll do step by step. So just real fast, I put my little lead over my dog red zone here. If I tell him sit, if I've never told him sit before in my life, then I might as well just be scuba dog. He has no clue. And then if I add a haptic signal where I apply pressure, well, what the heck is that all about? Remember in semiotics, from semiotics, remember that? For when dogs communicate with other dogs, dog A sends a signal to dog B, not knowing dog B's state of mind. Dog B, if it can interpret the signal, will respond or not respond simply as a consequence of dog A. In other words, we're not striking up a two-way conversation here. No, I'm trying to influence your behavior. So in the very beginning, we want to make sure we do what's called intended pairing by giving two signals at the exact same time. We say sit, we apply pressure. 
How much pressure? Dog determines that. Some dogs, I can just barely move my wrist, and they sit. Others, uh, I give a little bit more. But then the signal continues, auditory, so it's okay to repeat it. You hear so many times, you should only have the telecommand one time. You know what? You're going to get to that point, whether you like it or not, when it gets over here. But for right now, hey, brother, keep giving me the clues, man. Sit. 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 Hello. Sit. There's no problem with that. It's just kind of know this. About the third sit that you said, you may need to increase your haptic signal, that pressure. Because we don't want to take all day to get this thing done, even outside the context of encountering unfamiliar people and unfamiliar dogs or whatever causes you to be aggressive. And then eventually the dog will sit. And when it does, you reward. Now, again, this is happening initially outside of those reactive moments. You're, this is you and your dog, one-on-one. -on -one. That's all it is, you and your dog, one-on-one. -on -one. No distractions at all. Then finally, mild distractions. And then finally, as this thing starts to travel all the way over here to implicit, man, I'm telling you what, now you're ready for the big show. Okay, now what happens here is that just by doing this, the dog soon, if it could talk, it would go, okay. So I don't know what this word sit means, but I have noticed this. When that bean right there, that furless biped, says sit, I feel this pressure. I don't like the pressure. It's not horrible, but I really would just like to avoid it. And I've noticed that the pressure stays on, and he keeps saying sit until my butt hits the ground. And then suddenly, there's a release of the signal. You release the pressure, and the dog is rewarded. So the dog is hmm, I'm kind of starting to get this now. So do says sit, I get pressure, but his ground, he lets go of pressure, I get reward. So, me being the smart dog that I am, hey Brian, is there is there a chance that if you say sit, I could just sit and avoid the pressure altogether? Amen. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Smart animals they are. So that's why it's called avoidance conditioning. In the voice conditioning, you get the signal. Sit, and sometimes when you get to over here and the dog does as well, don't even you won't even have to get the word set out. You can just replace it with a slight little upward pressure, a slight low one, not a correction level. Just hey, I need you to sit. Remember in the beginning here, these aren't corrections. There's nothing the dog hasn't done anything wrong. This is just me trying to teach you how to do something. I'm trying to give you a bunch of clues. There's other clues coming in, all this stuff, visual, all those sorts of stuff, but I'm going to skip that today. This is not correcting. This is you doing. I'm giving you a stereotyped signal, and I'm requiring a stereotyped response. And that's the only way we get to over here. Okay, so in avoidance, I say sit, or I give a slight pressure. You sit, I reward you. If you fail to sit, now I will, at this point, when we're over here in implicit land, that is when I can start to turn on the correction. Okay, no, I'm in it. Because what happens is that we have signal prioritization. Meaning, yeah, I heard you, Brian, say sit, but there's a dog coming. No, 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 excuse me, dog. My dog, I'm signal number one. I am number one. I'm on the front burner. That thing that's approaching us is on the back burner. When it comes to signal prioritization, your job as the handler, if you want to have a dog that is manageable, that you can take safely out into the public, have guests over your home, own multiple dogs, then your signal will always be the number one signal against all the other comp competing and competitor type signals. I get that there's squirrels. I get that there's cats. I get that there's other dogs and other people and bicycles and so on and so forth. But I, my signal is number one. And this weekend, I'm going to show you a couple of videos in which you will see how that occurs among wolves in the wild and also our dogs. Okay, so now let me just kind of demonstrate up here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to demonstrate with my good old friend here, Red Zone. Uh, you'll learn this weekend why his name is Red Zone. But for right now, I'm just borrowing him because Joshua is going to show you with a live dog. 
But this guy cooperates pretty darn good for me. He stands still. I can pick him up by his ear and his tail and, and do all sorts of things with him that if I did that with Captain, especially with Captain's tail, he's very particular about his tail, he'd take my hand off. Okay, number one, take your tool. Remember we showed you yesterday, this is one of our little 3 8 uh, nylon slip leashes here. We take this, we go over the dog's head, okay? Then I'm going to make it snug and then slide up my leather tab until it is snug. Now, again, no choking. If you're choking your dog, why do you think it's trying to learn how to get my air back? I could care less about this word sit, scuba knock. I could care less about any darn thing. I just want my air back. So, yeah, I mean, there could come a point that you get to that if it's a real big struggle between you, your dog, and the other, the other dog approaching or the other human. But, but that isn't at this moment. So right here, once we have that on, now we command sit, and at the same time, we apply a little pressure. Now, the thing I want you to hone in on here right now is this. Look where my hand is. It's in close, in control. Number two, it's an underhand grip. Underhand grips allow me to use my wrist. My wrist allows me to feel. It gives me biofeedback. It lets me know how much pressure I'm applying. It lets me feel how the dog is responding. Not watching, feeling. So much of dog training is about feeling, feeling. So I say sit, roll, I make sure my hand's already rolled underneath, over here. That, that's not feeling. That, that makes you use your shrugging muscles. That's for lifting up something heavy. But when they roll the hand underneath, Oh, you could paint the Sistine Chapel by rolling your hand underneath with a paintbrush. So roll it underneath, sit, apply pressure. How much? To whatever is necessary to start action. People ask me that all the time. How much pressure do I give, Brian? Okay, if I give a little bit of pressure, and the dog stands there and looks at me like I'm stupid, well, I'm going to give a little bit more. Something has to motivate the animal to immediately start problem solving and go, okay, so what the heck does sit mean? And what's this pressure all about? And how can I make this go away? So it's more like an irritant level, more like a Johnny on the spot level. So yeah, I'm going to apply pressure until I get immediate action. And then once I get that action, I'm just going to stay with it until the animal sits. Then I'm going to release that pressure. And this dog dictates what that degree of pressure will be, not me. So I'm not being inhumane. I'm simply using a communication tool that animals understand. Otherwise, I'd just show them a video. I'd give them a book to read and hope that he could pick it up. But this isn't how animals communicate. So I'm just tapping into nature. I'm not going to put my mouth on his neck. So I'm using a tool like this that replicates the same thing. Sit, pressure. As soon as the dog sits, I release. And avoidance conditioning looks like this. Sit, dog does, great, awesome. No need for any pressure, no need. Dog dictates. But that avoidance conditioning is not gonna to happen until you cross a magical threshold of repetition, whatever that takes. Man, for me, with some subjects like biology and everything, God, I, I, I was like a sponge. I couldn't get enough of it. I picked up on everything. But when it came to math, huh, especially when they introduced the alphabet to it, I'm going, why'd you introduce the alphabet? I thought it was all about numbers. That's it. I never did get to this part over here. And I'm still not there. All right, so that's what you do. And you need to practice this probably no less than about two or 300 times, doing about 50 to 50 or so a day. And you can do it outside, inside, you name it. Just keep the distractions mild. Say, sit, apply pressure. You don't even step to avoidance land until you've done at least about 100 to 150 of these. The dog has to earn the right to go here. Guys, I'm working on this. Remember, implicit. Implicit is so powerful that when you try to shove this back to explicit land, you will have problems. And give you an example, go up to a major league baseball player. He just knock him out of the park. So you walk up to him and go, dude, you're amazing. How do you do that? How do you knock these baseballs out of the park? Do you like 
Do you hold both of your hands together and wrap that thumb over that thumb there and that thumb up underneath there? And then how, how far do you bend your knees and spread your legs? And do you kind of lean on one leg more than you lean on the other leg? You go asking him a bunch of those questions, I guarantee for about the next 30 swings, he wouldn't be able to hit the broad side of a barn. Because guess what he's going to be doing? Instead of just doing, he's going, well, how do I put my thumb? As a matter, well, as, well, I know. I think I actually, I think I lean on my leg a little bit more than I lean on this leg over here. Game over, game over. So just kind of remember that if you're playing some sport against someone and they're killing you, ask them those questions. How did you hit that backhand like that, man? That's amazing. How did you swing that golf club like that? It's done. You own them for at least for a little bit till they hop back into here. But you're trying to force that implicit. Back to explicit land, you cannot get that thing done without creating all sorts of problems. So again, do this till you can do it in your sleep. Then you're ready for this. And then when you can do that in your sleep, then you're ready to do what Joshua and I showed yesterday. Okay, now I'm going to step out of the limelight here, and I'm going to let Joshua bring a dog named Bug. Bug is his name. And he's going to demonstrate doing it in real life. So Bug's a dog here that's in training. So Joshua, let's do escape conditioning first. Sit. So he says sit, he gave a little pressure, the dog sat, he released the pressure, and gives our boy a reward. Okay, just free him up and do it again. Okay, so now hone in on him, McKenzie. Sit. Right at the same time, as soon as he said sit, he gave, so sit is the auditory signal. The pull up is the haptic signal, so it's called a single sweep. And now he rewards the dog at the end. One more time on that, Joshua. One more time. Watch his hand position in close, in control. I can feel the dog. The dog sits. Bingo, we reward. Now, as in yesterday, yesterday, this is not how we would do this part right here, the reward part. Because remember, we don't reward until the danger is gone. Until whatever is gone. The opponent, it could be. Not always danger. It could be an opponent. So we wait until they are gone. All right, now let's see if we can show what avoidance conditioning looks like. All right, so on this one, pay attention because there will be no pressure. Nicely done. Nicely done, Bug. Way to go, dude. Okay, one more of those. So the, really the biggest difference is that we simply took away one of the signals, the haptic signal. Nicely done. So that means that if you do this until it becomes a biological reflex, yeah, once you're out there on that street and that unfamiliar person, that unfamiliar dog's approaching, Sit. And you're going to want that, or you're going to want to feel that pressure because you should not be looking at your dog. It's sit. You are watching the approaching person, the approaching dog. You're measuring the length of that retractable leash. You're looking for escape routes. Mm, okay, so if this person lets this dog come over here, where do I go? And those people who live in those high rises and they live in those apartments, you are constantly vigilant. You are in training mode. Training mode till you can do this like an instinct. So it's before that elevator, you're going down. Six, five, four, three, two, one. I'm ready. And boom, the door opens. Oh, we're good. Heel. And out we go. Same thing. Going out of that apartment complex. Step out that door. Coast is clear. Step out. Sit. Lock that door behind you. Yeah, people should watch you and go, what's he doing? He looks a little suspicious. Yeah, but that, that's called good training. That's the hardest thing to put in people's heads, is that they just have to think about it. Because we get in this land here. Oh, I go out of my house. I turn. I put my keys in. I start texting while I'm walking. I got all these things I do, and I go about my own way of doing things. And I, I stop at the place to get coffee on the way to work. Guys, new material. Now you earn the right to think about other things. Because while you're thinking about other things, half your brain is thinking about what you got to get done here with your dog. So you'll never be caught off guard. Ever. You are constantly and forevermore ready to go. 
Okay, well, did I back the bus up far enough? I hope I did. If I didn't, let me know. <laughs> we'll back it up a little bit further. No more from you, Josh. I think you can just take Bug out of here, please. Uh, but, yeah, I got a peanut gallery going on over here. She's digging this. Guys, I hope you stay safe. You know the rules. If you found this information beneficial to you or you think it's going to be beneficial to someone else, please share it. And then also, if you have any questions or you have any suggestions, send them in. I am going to spend about the next five or six days rolling on the rest of this reactive stuff, getting into fearful dogs, getting into guests coming into the house, teaching the down real quickly so that we can utilize that. We've already taught that in a previous video. How do we implement it during walks, during guests, even in the car? So we'll cover all that. So we got a little bit more time to spend in the reactive dog, aggressive dog area, and then we'll head off into something new. So any suggestions, any area we didn't cover, if I need to back up the bus, just let me know. All right, guys, I'll check in with you tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. Be safe.